right, so this is the um, lecture to go with acids and bases. Uh, this is currently unit 11 for us, and this is the first lecture that goes along with your notes. With this lesson, you're going to learn to identify different properties of acids and bases, um, understand the purpose of an indicator, figure out how to define an acid and a base using um, two different definitions, the Arrhenius definition and the said lowry and then to be able to write conjugate acids and bases. So as we are comparing acids and bases, acids have a sour taste to them and a pH of less than seven. Bases taste bitter and have a pH of greater than seven. So acids, we tend to eat a lot of acids. They taste tart and we like that tart tangy taste. Um, we don't tend to eat as many things that are basic. Um, baking soda, you can see down here, is used um, and that's a basic compound. And there's a few other things that we eat that are basic, but mostly you can see lemon juice, wine, okay um all your all your juices are acidic um, and many of the foods we like tend to be on the acid side now when you mix an acid and a base together they will neutralize each other so mixing an acid and a base is a neutralization reaction and um, a neutralization reaction is just a fancy type of double replacement reaction and when you mix these two things together, you get water and a salt. And remember, a salt is just any ionic compound. We're using the salt term generically. So that means a metal with a nonmetal. Okay. So here's two examples of uh, neutralization reactions. I have hydrochloric acid with potassium hydroxide. And so here it produces my water, and then this is my potassium chloride, which is a salt. Um, this is another example involving hydrochloric acid, and I am mixing it with magnesium hydroxide, which is also known as milk of magnesia. And I get my water again, and this time my magnesium chloride is my salt. So, um, Hydrochloric acid is found in your stomach, and if you have too much stomach acid going on, you get an upset tummy or those really nasty burps, and so we eat, um, we, or we'll drink milk of magnesia or we'll eat Tums in order to help neutralize that excess stomach acid. Um, Alka-Seltzer works in the same vein. Both strong acids and strong bases will conduct electricity because they are strong electrolytes. Weak acids and weak bases are weak electrolytes. So in that picture to the left, or sorry, to the right, that is a conductivity apparatus. So you've got these probes here. I'm going to use a different color. So you've got these probes right there, these two metal prongs. And if you have ions in a solution, they will help connect and complete the circuit. And then the light bulb will go on. And that's if you have a lot of ions in solution. Well, you tend to have a lot of ions in solution when you have a strong electrolyte. If you have a weak electrolyte, you only have a few ions in solution and the light bulb is not going to glow as bright. And then if you have a non-electrolyte, the light bulb shouldn't come on at all. Now, indicators are weak acids or bases that have a different color from their original acid or base. We use indicators to help us understand pH and again, whether or not something's acidic or basic. Now, these two here, the red litmus and the blue litmus, you might want to star those or highlight them in your notes. These two I am going to ask you to learn. All these other ones on the list, I'm not. So the red litmus and the blue litmus, you need to know these two for your test, okay? I included the others because you've seen the, these other ones. You've seen bromothymol blue in action. You've more than likely seen phenothaline. And then I'm going to show you a demo with universal indicator. So again, these are the two you want to memorize, the red litmus and the blue litmus. So this one right here is blue litmus paper. 
If I put an acid on blue litmus paper, it turns red. I really think it looks pink, but everybody says it's red. This is my red litmus paper. If I put acid on my red litmus paper, there's no effect. It just looks like wet litmus paper. Okay? If I put a base on there, it turns blue. And so that helps me understand that it is a base. Now this one right here, bromothymol blue, we got to use this in a lab. That's BTB there. Um, for our gases unit. So when it is an acid, it's yellow. And when it's a blue, it's base. You might have seen it in green. A few of my BTB bottles are green. And that's because this is more of a neutral pH. So it's halfway between the yellow and the green. Um, phenothaline, um, you probably saw this in biology class when they did the STD lab. When you do the phenothaline, okay, it's colorless when it's an acid or it's this hot, bright pink fuchsia color when it's a base. And then universal indicator is one of my favorites. I'm going to do a demo with that in class. It makes a rainbow of colors with acid being red at the one end of the spectrum and purple being blue or being base down at the other end. It's really neat. But again, those are the only two that I'm going to test you on are the red litmus and the blue litmus. Now, a special property of base is they feel slippery like soap. Okay, so if you ever get that slippery, slimy feeling, okay, it's because it's a base. And this is also very common in household cleaners. So if you're doing a lot of house cleaning one day and you're not wearing gloves and then you start to notice kind of a slippery feeling on your fingers, that's because a lot of what you're using um, tends to be basic. One property of acids is they react with active metals to form salts and a hydrogen gas. So here's my acid, my hydrochloric acid. I've got my metal, magnesium, right here. Here's my hydrogen gas being given off. And then again, my salt is just a generic metal with a non-metal. So in this picture here, they've got magnesium, they've got their hydrochloric acid, and then down here is the magnesium chloride, and then up here are my hydrogen gas bubbles being produced. Um, we've seen this a couple of times. You've actually done a lab where instead of magnesium, you did zinc, and you actually got zinc chloride. So back in the beginning of the school year, I had you put a piece of the zinc metal on a watch glass and drip some hydrochloric acid, and you were supposed to observe that it was fizzing. So um, that would help you see that. Um, also, when they throw the sodium into water, that was another example of a um, large hydrogen gas release. This one I just like to include because I think it's fun. Um, the effect of acid rain on marble. Most rain is acidic, and that's due to the pollution in the air. On the East Coast, they have a lot more factories and um, coal factories and pollution. So their rain can be really acidic. So statues are often made out of calcium carbonate, which is a basic compound. So after years of exposure to acid rain, what you get is zombie George Washington. The acid rain has reacted with his face and has been eating away the marble over many years and causing damage to the statue. So that's just one effect you see of um, acids out there in your life. Now, here's some examples of acids and bases. Um, you've got a chart to fill in some of these on. These orange ones are, the orange ones are strong acids or strong bases. Okay, now you don't have to memorize these and I just point out the strong ones to help you know better what one's strong and what's weak. I'm not asking you to memorize these. So hydrochloric acid, we talked about hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is stomach acid, also known as muriatic acid, and it is used in swimming pools to help balance the pH. 
Um, nitric acid's used in industrial compounds, a lot of factory processes. Sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is found in car batteries. Do not open up your car battery. Okay, because also in the movies, when they dissolve a body, they're talking about sulfuric acid. It's some pretty nasty stuff. Phosphoric acid is found in Coca-Cola. If you actually read the label to Coca-Cola, it says phosphoric acid right on the label. They don't hide it. Other sodas have acid in them too, but I just use Coke as an example because I know it's there on the label. Acetic acid is also known as vinegar. Now, the vinegar we buy in the grocery store is 5% acetic acid. The other 95% is water. Okay. So, um, again, you wouldn't really want to encounter pure acetic acid. It smells like super vinegar. But acetic acid in the right concentration is enjoyable. We like our hot sauce and salad dressing. Acetic acid is a component of that. A fun thing to do is to take those Taco Bell hot sauce packets and squeeze it on the pennies and leave it there for a few minutes and then clean off the penny with a napkin and it'll clean the penny. And that's because of the acetic acid found in the hot sauce. You could also probably do it at home with Tapatio. Okay. So some information about bases. Potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide are strong bases. If you like to eat pretzels, okay, or olives, that is part of the preparation for pretzels or olives. They either soak them in sodium hydroxide or um, cook them in that. Now they are rinsed really well before you eat them, but that is something that they're used for. Um, calcium hydroxide is used in building supplies. We talked about magnesium hydroxide earlier, helping as an antacid. And then ultimately we've got ammonia, which is Windex. So again, this is just like the acetic acid. Windex is not ammonia in its pure form, but it is definitely a component. You can see it right there on the label. There's the ammonia. Okay. So one thing I do want to point out, I'm going to erase all my stuff, okay, is take a look at the formulas. Look at the formulas that you have here and note all that the acids have in common. Look at these chemical formulas, okay? So what do all of these have in common? Well, what you might note here is they all start with an H. All your acids start with hydrogen. And if you take a look at your bases, all your bases have this hydroxide right at the end, the OH, with the exception of the ammonia. Where's the OH? That's something that we are going to talk about coming up. Okay, so a quick little check for understanding. A student wants to test an unknown substance and try and figure out what it is. She put some on blue litmus paper and the paper stayed blue. On red litmus paper, it turned blue also. Is this compound most likely one, an acid or two, a base? So on blue litmus paper, it stayed blue. And on red litmus paper, it turned blue. So if we go back and look at our chart, back, 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 there we go. Okay, so on blue litmus paper, it had no effect. And on red litmus paper, it turned blue. So that tells me that my compound should be a base. Back. Okay, so a base would be an answer to that question. Now we're going to break down the definitions of acids and bases. And in reality, there's three definitions of acids and bases. You are going to be responsible for two of them. So the first one is the Arrhenius definition, and this was developed in 1887. 
And what Arrhenius said was that acids, when you put them in water, make hydrogen ions and bases make hydroxide ions. So it's kind of like what we saw on the other slide with the list of the acids and bases. All the acids started with base, I'm sorry, all the acids started with H, all the bases ended with OH with one exception. And that's the problem with the Arrhenius definition. Under the Arrhenius definition, only hydroxides are bases. So ammonia and H3 could not be an Arrhenius base. But we know ammonia is basic because we can test the pH and the pH is greater than seven, which makes it a base. So this definition wasn't perfect, but we'll get to a modification later on. It's still a definition we use though, which is why we're learning it. Now, this is something I am going to say time and time again. The strength of the Arrhenius acids and bases depends on how much it ionizes in water. It has nothing to do with pH. I circled this point. I want you to do it in the same in your notes. Circle it, start, highlight it. I guarantee you, you're going to see it on your test, and I know it's on your worksheet. Now, what ionization is, is that's the process by which molecules form a cation or an anion. Well, and an anion. So it splits into its pluses and minuses. Another term for this is called dissociation. And dissociation is just the, the separation of the ions in an ionic compound. So for example, if I have HCl, hydrochloric acid ionizes into H plus and Cl minus. It splits in its two ions. If I look at a base like calcium hydroxide, it ionizes into the calcium ion and two hydroxide ions. And the whole reason for that too is because of this two right here. If that was for three OH, I would have said three OH minus like that, okay? So that's what we mean by ionization or dissociation. So how much that happens is what determines whether or not it's an acid or a base. Strong acids and strong bases dissociate nearly completely. Weak acids and weak bases only a little bit. And I'm going to keep saying this. Strength of the acids and bases have absolutely nothing to do with their pH. Okay? Students mistakenly think that all acids have a really low pH, but they don't necessarily. It just depends on how much water you have. Or sometimes students think that weak acids and bases aren't dangerous and they won't hurt you, but they can be just as dangerous and they can still kill you. So, little test here, acids or base. Okay, so if we look at lithium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide here has that OH, so we would call that a base. This is a strong base, much like sodium hydroxide or um, potassium hydroxide, like I showed you in the other one. This is hydrofluoric acid. So it starts with that H. So it is, number one, it's an acid. Hydrofluoric acid is used to engrave glass. It's also something that will kill you if you get a lot on you. It's a weak acid. So again, this is an example of something that's a weak acid, but still dangerous to handle. This next one, well, we just did that example. We've got the OH, and so that makes it a base. This one starts with the hydrogen. It is sulfuric acid. This one here, HI, starts with the hydrogen again so it falls into the acid category this is hydroiodic acid and then lastly again i've got that oh ending so potassium hydroxide is a base now bronsted lowry came up with the second definition of acids and bases and bronsted is for danish that's why he's got the funny O for his name. And then Lowry was an English guy. And the two of them helped come up with this other definition of acids and bases. And what they said is that acids are hydrogen ion donor and bases are hydrogen ion acceptor. 
Now, sometimes they do use the term proton donor and proton acceptor. So they use the terms interchangeably. And the reason is this, I just wanna review real quick. You've got hydrogen, which has a mass of one, and it's element number one. So if I subtract those two, it has zero neutrons. Hydrogen, since it's element number one, has one proton and one electron. So this is hydrogen. If I'm talking about the hydrogen ion, H+, it still has zero neutrons, okay? We can't change the number of protons without changing the element, so it has one proton. But to get that plus charge, that means it had to lose its electron. So because a hydrogen ion only has a proton, sometimes they use these two terms interchangeably that a H plus is equal to a proton. Now what's different about the Bronsted-Lowry definition is that acids and bases always come in pairs. You're always gonna have, oops, back up here. You're always gonna have both an acid and a base in a reaction. You won't have two acids or a base and nothing else. So Bronsted-Lowry said they always come in pairs. And you make these conjugate acids and bases. So what conjugates are, is they're what becomes, they're what's what becomes of the original acid or base. So a conjugate base is the remainder of the original acid after it donates its hydrogen ion. So you can see here, HNO3 is an acid. It's got that hydrogen. Here, it's gone. And so the acid becomes a conjugate base. The term flips. Notice because I lost a plus charge, I go from zero to a negative one for my charge. You're gonna have to pay attention to the charges while you do these things. A conjugate acid is the remainder of the original base after it gains a hydrogen ion. So here's where we can fix the ammonia problem that Arrhenius had. We know NH3 is a base, like I said, from looking at the pH, but it can become a conjugate acid by gaining a hydrogen. So notice here I go from three hydrogens to four hydrogens. And since I gained an H plus, an H plus was added to it, my charge goes from zero to a plus one. Okay, so we're gonna practice a little bit about writing conjugate acids and bases. So whenever you see a Bronsted-Lowry equation, it's gonna look something like this, okay? This HA here is just a generic term for an acid. And you can see the acid is what it becomes over here, the A minus, after it donates its protons. So this H is gone on the other side. That means it's donating its proton. And since it donates its proton, it becomes, it's an acid. That must mean the water is a base because like I said, they always come in pairs. Okay, and that would make this here a conjugate acid. So you should take a moment and label these on your notes. I don't mind when you guys do your worksheets if you abbreviate conjugate acid and conjugate base. That's fine with me. Okay, so just a reminder there that acid's a hydrogen ion donor and base is a hydrogen ion acceptor. So let's do a real example, not just a generic. Oh, wait, before we do that, this is important. You guys didn't know this term before. H30 or H3O, it's not zero, this is oxygen. H3O plus one is called hydronium ion. And again, I'm giving you a hint here, circle, star, square it, something to indicate, hey, Miss Cool thinks that's important. She's gonna ask about it. So you need to know what the name of the hydronium ion is and its formula. Okay. Now onto a real example. So here, we've got our general equation. The NH3 gains a hydrogen. It becomes an NH4. So you're always looking to see what it becomes on the other side. I'm looking at my reactants. My reactants are my acids and bases, okay? And then my conjugates are over here on the product side. So I follow my nitrogen. My hydrogens go from three to four. So since I gained a hydrogen, it accepted a hydrogen on the other side, that means this is a base. 
Well, if that's a base, then what it becomes must be a conjugate acid. And as I said before, these always come in pairs. So that must mean my water here should be an acid. If it's an acid, that should mean it lost a hydrogen. And remember, another way to write water is HOH. So that's what happened. My water lost a hydrogen and it became, the conjugate acid became the conjugate base right there. So I'd like you to pause, take a moment and label these. Look at your notes and make sure you can label these compounds. Hey, so I look at my HCl, and again, I'm just taking the first thing there, and my HCl becomes the Cl. So it lost a hydrogen. Instead of losing it, we could say it donated a hydrogen, and if it donated a hydrogen, that makes it an acid. Acids turn into conjugate bases. Over here, that must mean my water would be a base. If it's a base, then that means I should gain a hydrogen on the other side. And that's exactly what it does. It becomes a conjugate acid. Okay. So one thing I want to point out is if you look at this right here, look at my two waters, okay? The water acts as both an acid and a base. Use a different color. So in one equation, it's an acid, and in another equation, it's a base. And there's a special term for this. It's called amphoterism. And amphoterism is when something can act as both a Bronsted-Lowry acid and as a Bronsted-Lowry base. Right? So that's an amphoteric thing. So here's an example of three amphoteric substances. And let's say on this side, we want it to lose a hydrogen. And on this side, as we fill in a chart, we are going to gain a hydrogen. Okay. So I already showed you what happens with water. Water, when it loses a hydrogen ion, becomes hydroxide. And water, when it gains a hydrogen ion, becomes hydronium ion, like that. So let's do another example, the hydrogen carbonate ion here. If it loses a hydrogen, it becomes CO3 because we lost that hydrogen. Also, my charge goes down. That negative one, it becomes more negative because I lost that hydrogen and my charge becomes a negative two. On the other side, I'm gonna gain a hydrogen. So go, I'm gonna go from one hydrogen to two hydrogens. And I gained a hydrogen, and that's a positive. So up here in the corner, I'm not going to write anything because there's no charge on it. It's neutral. In the last example, this is dihydrogen phosphate. I'm going to lose one hydrogen. So I just subtract one of the first hydrogens, HPO4. And my charge is going to go down. So that makes it a negative two. And then on gaining, I'm going to add in another hydrogen. So it's H3PO4, which is phosphoric acid. And my charge goes up because I'm adding a hydrogen ion and it's a zero charge on the other side, okay? So only these things in the center boxes are amphoteric. These things on the left-hand side, not amphoteric. On the right hand side, not amphoteric, okay? Only the stuff in the middle. There are other amphoteric compounds that you'll have to be able to identify. Okay, lastly, just a little bit of practice. Write the conjugate base of the Bronsted-Lowry acid. So this is an acid. That means it's going to donate a hydrogen. So if we donate a hydrogen, HCN, would become CN and it we're donating an H plus so we go zero down to a negative one and then HPO4 minus two we're gonna donate a hydrogen PO4 and my charge goes down it becomes more negative 
negative 3. These are now Bronsted-Lowry bases, and I ask you to write conjugate acids. So bases are going to gain a hydrogen ion. Right? So if we gain a hydrogen ion, it becomes H2CO3, and the charge is now neutral because a negative 1 plus 1 equals 0. And then my sulfate ion here, I'm going to add in a hydrogen, just one, SO4, and a negative 2 plus 1 equals, oops, a negative 1. So a negative 1 charge for that one. So HSO4 minus 1 would be the answer to that. All right? So you should already have your assignment via email. And if you have any questions, please see me in class.